One of the most unsettling aspects of thinking about the possibility of alien civilizations and their expansion through a galaxy is the glaring reality that in our solar system's 4.6 billion year history, there does not appear to ever have been any attempt to colonize this star system. There is no strong evidence for anyone to have ever been here, and the history of Earth and the solar system simply looks like a whole lot of completely natural phenomenon, with nothing we've seen appearing artificial. Granted that a visitation cannot be ruled out at some point in the past from this. If that happened, they might not have taken much. And you can't rule out that there was once a civilization in general here due to the Silurian hypothesis that no traces of it have been preserved in the fossil record based on evidence on Earth. However, the moon preserves evidence much longer and so far nothing artificial has been seen regarding this idea. And most importantly, no evidence of mining. The moon's resources appear to be pristine and preserved from its formation. And so does Earth. One will find pop cultural claims of aliens coming to Earth to have humans mine its gold. But in reality, as the gold rushes of the 19th century show, the low-hanging fruit on this planet as far as gold appears to have been left untouched until we came along. Though the idea is sort of silly, the asteroids are full of far more accessible gold that you don't have to lift out of a gravity well, and they too appear untouched. And that goes for the entire periodic table. Most of what this star system had when it formed is still here in this star system, other than some radioactive elements that decayed into other atoms over the last 4.6 billion years. And things like particles from the sun. There are many reasons this could be ranging from aliens are too rare to interact with each other, aliens never leave home, and so on. But the point is, this star system appears pristine outside of what we've done. But there is another idea floating around that might provide another possible answer. The answer is that our star system isn't worth the trouble to visit yet, and that advanced civilizations have little use for an immature star system as opposed to an aged and element-rich red giant star system, and that they're simply waiting for the sun to get old, and then they swoop in. This idea involves star lifting, which is a group of hypothetical ways to remove matter and thus resources from a star. You may do this for materials, but also as a method of prolonging a star's lifetime kept in a certain state, or even to optimize a star's energy output this way for a Dyson Swarm. You may also even remove a substantial amount of material from a star to prevent it from going supernova. Stars naturally lose a tiny amount of mass compared to the whole over the course of their lives on the main sequence. This outflow comes in the form of the solar wind and coronal mass ejections and such. But against the overall mass of the star, it comes out to a tiny amount lost over its lifetime. Most of the ideas of star lifting involve manipulating the star to increase its outflow and then using magnetic fields to control it all. But all this requires energy. Remember the sun's gravity is absolutely enormous. It's holding the solar system together and lifting something out of it is difficult and energy intensive. Very much so for the sun and would require mega engineering to harvest energy from the sun in order to lift enough from it to be worth it but is going to need a partial Dyson Sphere or Swarm and at least 10% of the total output of the Sun to pull it off. That may not be worth it at all, especially for a star like the Sun. And that may be why when we look into the heavens, we do not detect anyone doing this to Sun-like stars. But an aging red giant with the mass of the Sun, which is where the Sun's evolution is heading, may change that equation and make it easier due to the star being so puffed up. There are several different hypothetical mechanisms for star lifting, however, if you can solve the energy requirement problem. The first way is to simply increase the solar wind output of the star by heating areas of the star's atmosphere. This is usually envisioned as being done with microwaves, lasers, or particle beams and the result would literally be a set of sustained solar flares on the surface of the star at its poles. Now, I do not think anyone is doing this in the Milky Way for a good reason. That sustained solar flare should be easily detected by photometers and other equipment in astronomy, and it's not something stars normally would ever do. 
Incidentally, we can actually see natural solar flares and light curves regarding other stars. They appear as a sudden spike in light output, followed by a short decay period. Doing that kind of photometry on stars is very common in astronomy, and the catalog of light curves is huge, and nothing looks like this kind of sustained stellar lifting has been seen. The resulting flare would be harnessed through powerful magnetic fields, arranged in a specific way as to funnel the solar wind out in a pair of jets running through magnetic nozzles, which would also help cool the outflow for whatever use they might have for it. This would be a titanic effort requiring particle accelerator space stations, giant electrical current arrays, and a number of other mega-engineering projects, but it is hypothetically possible. Another method is the so-called huff and puff method. This is somewhat similar to the first method, but it doesn't require heating the star. Rather, the whole thing is done magnetically to increase the star's outflow. Basically, magnetic fields and stations are used to the effect of squeezing the star magnetically to increase the outflow. A third method also functions magnetically, but in a different arrangement of space stations around the star powering it that results in the outflow spraying out from the sides of the star, which would be rotating, making harvesting it more complicated than the other methods. This one would probably not be used for energy, but might make for a good way to remove and discard material when trying to stop a supernova or prolong a star's life. Any of these methods might potentially be visible as a technosignature. Once you get the material lifted out of the star, the idea gets murky because separating out the harvested elements in space has not been well explored other than it is possible. Most of what you're going to get through this is hydrogen and helium. Those gases have their uses, and they are mass, and hydrogen is good shielding, but they're not really otherwise construction materials. You would get other elements, but in far lesser numbers. Hypothetically, however, if you needed that amount of hydrogen and helium, storing it would be relatively easy for a civilization advanced enough to be able to star lift. You create a series of small artificial gas giants to store as much of the lifted material as you want. The arrangement of this might also be a technosignature, if they are arranged to orbit in some way that nature is unlikely to do. As an aside, there is a fun, if probably very dangerous and unrealistic idea hidden in here. If we were to star lift the sun, then why make an artificial gas giant to store everything when you have Jupiter just sitting out there lollygagging? The idea is that if you increase Jupiter's mass with hydrogen from the sun, when you hit about 100 times its current mass, it would hit nuclear fusion and ignite Jupiter as a tiny star. While this might be useful for harvesting energy, that shifting of mass would probably wreak absolute havoc on the orbits of the other planets, including potentially knocking Earth into another, not very human-friendly, chaotic orbit. If someone did this in another star system, however, and had no such concerns, the very smallest possible star hanging in the orbit of a former planet, or serendipitously seeing a gas giant transform into a star, might be an obvious SETI technosignature, if an unlikely one. The bottom line here, though, is that when you have gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, it's probably going to be easier to get your hydrogen and helium there than it is from the Sun, far less of a gravity well. And the idea of stellar lifting is so titanic of an undertaking that no one out there does it. It's also hard to envision why you would want that much hydrogen helium, maybe enormously large scale fusion energy, or why you wouldn't get your raw materials from asteroids and interstellar objects. After all, if you can lift material from a star, you have to have had access to material to do that. But there is one area where stellar lifting may be more practical, as in frantically, and that is preventing your star from dying. One major problem with a star like the Sun is that it is not fully convective. So the reason red dwarfs have such long lives, trillions of years, is because they are fully convective. So all of the hydrogen of the star eventually convects to the core, fueling the star. The sun does not do this. It's accumulating helium ash in its core. And when that gets to be too much, then the red giant phase begins. So to save a star like the sun, you will need to do something with the accumulating helium ash. Not easy, even for an advanced civilization. 
but if it's about to die and you're stuck in the system and can't go colonize another star, you may have no choice and might come up with something. It's worth noting here that you would only do this with a Type G Sun analog to Starlift for most reasons. You wouldn't do this with a Red Dwarf, because once it's near death, it's completely used up all its fuel. There's nothing to save it to prolong its life. For materials, it's less than a larger star. Type K you might be able to do it with, they aren't fully convective. But it may too not be worth it. Type F stars are weird. For one, they are not likely to spawn life on their planets, due to the titanic amount of ultraviolet and high energy light they emit. And lifting from one of those more massive stars would be more difficult than the sun. But oddly, these stars, while they aren't fully convective, they are more convective overall than the sun, despite being larger and hotter. The idea of stellar lifting from a low-mass red giant, though, has not been heavily looked into, but it seems possible, and possibly easier and more feasible. I think more thought should be put into expanding SETI searches to areas where we previously weren't looking, like low-mass red giants not bent on going supernova, or even black holes for technosignatures as advanced aliens may not want the sun. They may have motives instead to try to head to black holes and high energy environments as they advance, or potentially certain low mass red giants, which the sun will become. But saving the sun through stellar lifting is something we may do in our far future to save Earth. And there is a trick here if you've got the time. One thing about this is that as you reduce the mass of the sun by removing material, its rate of nuclear fusion decreases less pressure to drive it in the core. This slows down its aging, but also means it emits less energy, which you need for stellar lifting. But since you're getting a lot of hydrogen and helium, that means you will have plenty of fusion energy available. Since the sun will not use all of its fuel, you could also make a new artificial star from scratch to keep your civilization going, leaving Jupiter alone to continue its lollygagging and in the process prevent the sun from going red giant. You could in principle create a bunch of extremely low mass, long lived red dwarfs in succession, after the sun dies, to keep you going indefinitely, and save hydrogen and helium and artificial gas giants to make a new red dwarf when the rest of the stars start to blank out in the far future, if you can figure out a way on how to make the gravitational balance of all of this work. Thanks for listening, I'm futurist science fiction author John Michael Godier, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.